The second New Testament reading this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1 and verses 13 to 16, followed by chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. The reading starts on page 267 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bible and goes on to 268. The heading of the reading is By Faith. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Verses 13 to 16. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that there were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had not been thinking of the country they had left, they would have the opportunity to return. Instead, they are longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great clouds of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Here end of the reading. Thank you. Final reading comes from the book of Acts. Chapter 5, Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 27, Acts 5. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Him. It's good to be back home. It's uh, pleasant spending time in Cape Town with the family, uh, but nice to be back where you can wear shorts and t-shirt again rather than 14 jerseys and a scarf and a beanie and apparently it isn't yet winter, so <laughs> but it is good to be back. I've told this story before. My wife couldn't remember it. So I'm going to tell it again. If you remember it, I apologize. So the two women going for a stroll on Saturday, one Saturday afternoon. One has a Doberman Pinscher, the other one has a Chihuahua. So walk down the street, the one with the Doberman says, let's go over to this pub over here and have a drink. The one with the chihuahua says, we can't do that. We have dogs. They, they won't let us in. The one with the doberman says, just follow my lead. So she walks over to the pub, puts on a pair of dark glasses and tries to walk in. The bouncer stops her and says, sorry, lady, no pets allowed. So the woman says, don't you understand? This is my seeing eye dog. Do- the woman says, the, do- the, the, man, the bouncer says, the doberman pinch her. She says, yes, they're using him now. Very good. He says, you may go in. The lady with the chihuahua figures, well, that seemed to work. She's going to do the same thing. Puts on a pair of dog glasses and starts to walk in. The bouncer says, sorry, lady, no pets. The one with the chihuahua says, you don't understand. This is my seeing eye dog. The bouncer says, a chihuahua? The lady replies, a chihuahua? They gave me a chihuahua? (laughs) 
seeing is believing. And we live in a society that wants proof. We want to know how things work, why they work. For many, for many, they don't believe in God because they cannot see Him. They cannot see evidence of Him. And they would prefer to put their faith, faith in things they can see. They would want to trust things that they can see. Other people, money, success, health. It's much easier to say, well, I put my trust in Marshall Security Company for my safety. I can see their cars riding around. I can see their men I can, with bulletproof vests and their guns. I can see their alarm system in my house. I will trust Marshall or whichever other security company you use. Must, much easier to say, I will, I will trust in, in the Banting diet or the four fruit diet or the for my health. That will keep me safe. I will trust in sound education system. That's all I have to do. Let's get a sound education system. Then all my problems will be sorted. I will put my trust in that. I will put my trust in investment portfolios. I will put my trust in insurance policies. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting that any of these are wrong. But it's where we're going to put our trust. What are we going to say is my security? And in fact, the disciples and Thomas are no different. Thomas always gets bad press. There's no way, in fact, in the Bible <laughs> that he's called Doubting Thomas. I know we've looked at the story before, and I certainly don't want to contradict anything that Michelle said or that we, in, in our discussion that we had in our Bible study before um, on Thomas. Because, yes, there is this inability to believe and to trust that Jesus was alive. I want to look at his request, though, this morning and suggest that, in fact, it was not that unreasonable for him to ask for proof in the context of the story and especially after what the rest of the disciples had experienced. Now, the reason why I want to do that is because I believe that we are sometimes like Thomas. We doubt whether Jesus is alive. We doubt whether he really can help us. When you look at our situations, we look at our reality, we look at the reality around us, what's happening in our government, what's happening in the world. We pray. But in fact, we're going, well, Jesus can't really do anything about this. I need to do something concrete. I need to get something tangible that I can trust. Disciples, John tells us, are locked behind closed doors. They're together and they're afraid of, these Jewish, of the Jewish leaders. Verse 19 says, On the evening of the first day of the week, the disciples were together with doors locked. Seems strange behavior, don't you think? A group of people who have heard two testimonies. You probably would have looked at those over Easter. I know we did in the Methodist. I went to my mother's Methodist church. I was by far the youngest person there. <laughs> but hey, God bless them. <laughs> you would have looked at it over Easter. Two testimonies of saying that Jesus is alive. One from Peter, and we believe John, who Go to the empty tomb, see uh, it is empty, and say they believe. Mary, who physically meets Jesus in the garden, wants to touch him. Scott Hosea asked the question, why after hearing these two stories, were the disciples not out looking for Jesus? Think about this. Your best friend, your husband or wife, your child has disappeared. Somebody tells you that they saw them walking around Gateway. Then somebody else phones you and says, you know what, I actually, I met them in the mug and bean, we had coffee together. I shook their hand, said goodbye to them. Even if 
okay, these two people are a bit dodgy. You don't really trust them. I'm reckoning if you've lost somebody that you love, there is probably a good chance that you are going to get in your car and drive to Gateway to see if there's maybe just a little bit of truth in what they say. The disciples don't do this. Now the Bible tells us they don't do this because they are afraid. As we think about it, fear is a very powerful thing, isn't it? And it does affect how much we are prepared to trust. Think about those that have hurt you in a relationship. You struggle to trust them afterwards because you're afraid they're going to hurt you again. Something happens to us. We're afraid that it will happen again. And so we struggle to trust. It does paralyze us. It does stop us from believing. It does cause us to begin to second guess that which we hear, that which we read, even in Scripture and in worship. So perhaps as these disciples sit behind these locked doors and, and are chatting, they're talking about this very thing. Can we really believe? Can we trust this emotional woman who has the story that she saw Christ? And Peter and John, did, did, you, get to the, did you go to the right tomb? Were you in the right place? Are you sure you saw what you saw? This is the fascinating thing about this story. It's in the midst of that wrestling. Is this true? In the midst of this fear and doubt that Jesus appears. And his first words are, Peace be with you. I don't think that the disciples are part of that group that Jesus will mention later on in verse 29. They are not blessed because they have not seen and believed. They were sitting in the room, locked away, because I don't think they did believe. If they believed that Jesus was alive, if they believed He was the Son of God, that He was the Messiah, that He defeated death, they wouldn't have been hiding. They would have been, in fact, doing what they did in the passage that we read in Acts. They were out there telling people that Jesus is alive, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah. In fact, they would get whipped and beaten and crucified and killed because they so strongly believed that this was the truth, that Jesus was alive. Fear is often the lack of peace. And Jesus provides the foundation for this peace straight away. He says, look at my hands, I am alive. And he repeats again, peace be with you. Now, we're not sure why he says that. Why does he say it twice? I want to suggest that he's saying it twice because he's saying, I am the foundation of your peace. The fact that I'm alive means that you can know real peace. Despite the reality, he's saying to the disciples, of this fear that you have, perceived or not, of the fact that you could be killed tomorrow, that the Jewish leaders could come and destroy you like they destroyed Jesus. I want to tell you this morning that because I'm alive, you can know peace. That confidence and joy that they experience from their encounter with Christ is not meant for them, not meant to stay in that room. Because Jesus commissions them. He says, go and make disciples. Go and tell other people. And we believe that that commission is for us as well. He commands them to forgive sins. And I would suggest that there has been an interpretation that through the line of Peter, there can only be ministers that can forgive sins. I would suggest that that is not correct. Because I think this commission is to the whole church. And I think that this verse is saying that we as the church, that is the body of Christ, 
have this message of forgiveness, which we can choose to tell others, which Christ offers. And in turn, because Christ has forgiven us, we can choose to forgive others. And then we know peace. Think about what is happening in our country. Still that struggle really to forgive each other, to know each other. Christ is saying this morning that if He comes into our context, He gives us that ability to be able to forgive and to bring peace. And it's through Him alone. And what about Thomas? Well, he comes into this situation. He has, had, he has not had the same encounter with Christ as the other disciples have. But he has gone through the same experiences. He has seen the person who he trusted, who he loved, who he looked up to, who in fact partly believed that would rescue him from oppression and the nation of Israel from oppression. He's seen that person beaten up and killed. One commentator suggests that Thomas is already disappointed. His Savior is dead. And he does not want to be disappointed again. He wants proof. He wants to be sure that Jesus is alive. And this is the amazing thing. Look at the story. Jesus is happy to oblige. He's happy to come again. He's happy to meet Thomas in the place where he is. Thomas doesn't have to search for him. doesn't have to go to places looking for proof. In that place of anxiety, of fear and doubt, Jesus comes. And when presented with a proof, we don't even know if Thomas touches Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us that. It was an interesting thing as I read this scripture again. We simply know that the encounter, the fact that he's in the presence of Christ, means that he worships God. What is worship? Well, worship is simply acknowledging who God is. That's what I think it is. It's acknowledging who God is. Thomas calls Jesus my Lord, i.e. Jesus, you are the person that I'm going to serve. He says, you are my Lord, you're the person that I'm going to serve, and you are my God. Now, that is a very bold statement for a Jewish person to make, because only God could be God. A Jew would never call somebody else God. That's blasphemy. That's, in fact, remember the charge that Jesus, that God Jesus killed. He said he was God. But that encounter, that encounter means that, in fact, Thomas realizes that Jesus is not just a man, but in fact, he is the Messiah. Now, I think Jesus' response to Thomas is not always interpreted correctly. Perhaps that's why he gets bad press. You see, he doesn't answer him with a question And then a statement. He doesn't say, why did you not believe because you saw me? People who don't need to see me believe, and believe, they are the really good guys. So people who don't need to see me and believe, they, they are the good people. They are the blessed ones. I think this is what Jesus is saying. I think he's saying there are two ways to believe. Some have seen me and believe. And in the future, many will choose to believe even though they haven't physically seen me. But both require faith. You see, Thomas' reaction required faith. He needed to, at that moment, say, this is the Christ whom I choose to serve and worship. Or he could have said, look, I don't don't believe this isn't the Christ. And he could have walked out of the room. Both require faith. Corin Armstrong in her book, The Case for God, says that faith has come to, me, to believe, 
come to mean belief. But in fact, in the Greek, it actually means to trust in a person or a truth. To trust in a person or a truth. And when you look at uh, faith like that, it is much more relationship, relational, that word. <laughs> you see, lots of people believe in God. We live in, this, in, a, in a spiritual world, don't we? Do a, quite a, I've done quite a few weddings over the last month or two. Amazing, you know, as soon as people know you're the minister, they engage in, in, in spiritual conversation. They will tell you, no, 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 I, I believe in God. I believe in Him. It just mustn't affect my life. I, I want to do my own thing. You see, that, that's not putting your faith in God. That's putting your faith in yourself. That's what faith means. Faith means, I'm actually, God, I'm going to trust you with my life. The passage in the Hebrews talks about the relationship. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. I think that talks about a relationship. These, the, the writer describes all these people who have horrendous things happening to them. Horrendous. Yet, they still trust God. They still choose to put their trust in God. And then he ends by talking about this journey. And I think this describes faith. It is a journey. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We just run a race and it did take perseverance. <laughs> Fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. This is less about, less about proof, more about relationship in a person who we are and can trust. So I think the story of Thomas reminds us that it's okay to question. It's okay to wonder how and to why and to wonder why. It's okay to feel disappointed and to feel that God has let us down. It's okay to search for some sort of evidence, some sort of proof that Jesus cares for us. And I want to suggest this morning, brothers and sisters, that that proof will be found in a relationship with Christ. When I studied theology, the old dean said many things at the beginning of my journey. But one of the things he said was that you are, this, this process is going to challenge your thinking around Scripture and your understanding of the Bible. It's going to stretch you. You're going to, you're going to ask questions perhaps that you've never asked before or never been required to ask before. Make sure that as you engage in the process, you develop your relationship with Jesus. That that isn't the thing that in fact you throw aside as you search and journey. Always fascinates me, the people that I meet in the shopping center. Oh, I haven't seen you in church for a while. Ah, oh, you know, I've got some issues in my life and I just want to sort those out first and then I'll come back to church. Lord Jesus, have mercy. If I've got to sort out issues before I come here, you will never see me here. This is the place. This is the place that we have to wrestle with our doubts, our anxieties, and our fears. Jesus could have decided... And let us remember this. Jesus could have decided that, he's ma that he'd made it his appearance. He had commissioned the disciples. They had received the Holy Spirit. And he could have said, you know what? I've done my bit. Those who were not there, too bad. You've got to suck it up and just believe. But he doesn't do that. He chooses to come back for the one person. Thomas, he chooses to come back into his place of doubt and fear. He chooses to address with him his issues of insecurity. And I want to believe this morning he will do the same for us every time we doubt and every time we're fearful. 
He reminds us again this morning that he's alive. And he's with us. But we also have a commission. We have something to offer society. It is a message of hope, of reconciliation, to say that forgiveness is possible and that we can know peace even when there is danger around us, whether that danger is perceived or in fact whether it's a reality. So the Lord Jesus stands amongst us again this morning. He says, I am alive. Peace be with you. Amen. Let's pray. Perhaps in your mind's eye this morning you get a picture of Christ standing before you, these hands outstretched, saying, remember, this is what I did for you. This is how much I love you. This is how much I'm committed to you. And I'm with you. So take time now in the quietness of your heart to bring those things that you're anxious about, those things that you fear, those things that you doubt. Thank you, God, that you don't expect us never to doubt or to fear or to have moments where we struggle to trust you or believe that you're working. But did you come back every time into those places of insecurity, just like you did with Thomas? You come back and you you journey with us, you meet us at those places. And we've had opportunity to meet with you this morning in, in worship. And we pray that we also will respond, my Lord and my God. And we will be changed because we've worshipped, we've met around your table. Thank you that you don't give, on up, give up on us. And so as we face the week, there will be those times when the reality around us, the evil around us, the stress around us, the anxiety, whatever it is, uh, will seem to be speaking much louder than that still voice inside us. But may we hear you saying again, peace be with you. I am with you. I will not give up on you. May we know that this week all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.